All right. Welcome, everybody. This is Jonathan Lip here from the Big Alpha Film Festival. Thank you all for uh, checking out our discussion today. We are with Michael McGlone. Uh, Michael uh, has a great history as an actor, and now he has a new project out called Kenny the Gun, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Uh, but first, uh, Michael, let's talk first a little bit about um, the world of indie film, going back to when you first started out, uh, I would say back in the, in the 90s, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about, it's been about 25 years, right, since the first film, Brothers McMullen, came out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you could talk a little bit about, first of all, that experience, what it was like in the independent film world back then. We're going back to 1995. So how, mm. how, how was that sort of experience of independent film then? Well, it was so independent, Jonathan, that... Nobody knew who we were. Absolutely no one knew who we <laughs> Of course, I'm exaggerating, but we were so independent that we were almost absolutely unknown, which when we were making The Brothers McMullen was one of the reasons it was such a special experience. It was so pure. It was so heartfelt. Eddie had a gift from his father, which I believe amounted to his father's life savings to that time, or very close to that amount. And he said to his son, go make your film. And none of us were being paid. All the money was going toward whatever was necessary in terms of uh, other finances. And we were so dedicated and devoted to this marvelous script that Eddie created and had no idea what the destiny of it would be, could be, et cetera. It was, in my experience, almost strictly for the joy of doing it. There's always some idea of you want to get greater attention, et cetera. I just had no idea how that was even possible. So that was the purest experience of filmmaking that I believe I will ever have because it was before anything else. And when I say before anything else, I mean really anything else. There wasn't anything else really happening in the film world for me at that time. And there was this very special project that Eddie had created that we made on this extremely limited budget. And then it went to Sundance and won the festival and created careers for a number of us. So I don't know that that particular matrix of possibilities exists in, in, in the way that it did then. It's, so, it's such a bigger field now in the independent world. So while that is the case, I still believe the independent world is, is robust and beautiful and it's always the right time to make a movie because that's what filmmakers do. And it's, it's just different now because the field is so much larger. When we went to Sundance, it was really emerging. The independent world as it is now was really just emerging. Right, right. And you know, of course, getting into Sundance, uh, I mean, at that time, I'm sure there were a lot less entries than there are now. Um, would, would you say that at that time, getting into Sundance was uh, was it easier task or is it just as competitive you think as, as it would be today? I don't, I don't know what the process was. Eddie would be more equipped to answer that. I will say that the festival was much more grassroots when we were there. You saw other celebrities at the festival, though you didn't really see a lot of celebrity heavy films in the lineups. I think Basketball Diaries was there the year we were there. I am relatively sure there were maybe a, a, a couple of other films that you would recognize that were there that I, I'm not remembering at the moment, but they weren't heavily loaded either financially or uh, celebrity wise whereas now I, if you don't have a, a, a celebrity in your film i think it's much more difficult to get in to sundance at least that's the 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 feeling that i have in the experience that i've i've had to this time it's grown as a much more commercial enterprise right and, and also at that time 
I guess self-distribution wasn't as much of an option. And so you got picked up there by Searchlight. Uh, is that right? At, after Sundance. And then you got a theatrical release at that point. Uh, yes. Uh, Fox Searchlight bought the film. I believe they finalized the deal at Sundance. I don't know if the deal was done at Sundance or not, but it, it felt when we were there like something was being finalized. That might have just been my perception of it. Maybe they were already on paper with it. Mm. Though I know that once we left Sundance, it was definitely in, or at least my awareness is that it was definitely in Fox Searchlight's hands and we were moving forward with that distribution. Right, all right, yeah. So, yeah, in just a few minutes, I want to talk about sort of the world of distribution and how that's changed, which is why I wanted to bring that up. Uh, but then after McMullen, then you move on to, to She's the One, right? Mm -hmm. now, now, what was that experience like going from a, a small budget, very indie film into more of a sort of studio atmosphere? Did, did it have the same feeling on set or was a, was a whole different sort of environment? It was a different environment because it was more of an environment. Brothers McMullen, you know, we were shooting in Eddie's home, we were stealing shots on the subway and on the LIRR, and, you know, the environment was whatever we could get away with or whatever Eddie's family <laughs> was going to give us, you know, whereas with She's the One, there's a set you know, that we're going to go to and it's agreed and we don't risk arrest <laughs> on the set. <laughs> so the fact that there was actually a, a formidable quote unquote environment on She's the One was one of the most noticeable differences. And of course, there's there's the feeling of the money around it. You know, you have cast members that you recognize from TV and film and you have trailers and other accoutrements that come with a budget of multi-millions. And that was all, of course, very different. What wasn't fundamentally different was the energy of making a film with Eddie because he and I worked generally so naturally together and he wrote so well, he writes so well, that that experience was fundamentally the same. He, he, he wrote a great script. He wrote with me in mind for that role. And we had a ball on so many occasions, just going back and forth, brothers again, you know, he's, very much like in his personality, my real life brother, Joe, their astrological sign is actually the same. So it makes sense. And we essentially fundamentally had a, a wonderful time acting together as we commonly do. So there were things about it, yes, that had been blown up and it was all in greater relief, what was happening with our lives, et cetera. And then it was the same too, because it's, there's Eddie and here I am and we're having a lot of fun. Right, right. And, uh, and then of course, uh, you, uh, well actually before I put that, but she's the one also just, um, for those watching, like, again, the great supporting cast as well. You got John Mahoney, of course, Jennifer Aniston, Cameron Diaz, um, just a great cast as well. And then from She's the One, then you move on to the world of, uh, you go into uh, Subway Stories, uh, which was an HBO project, mm -hmm. uh, a series of, of sort of, they were sort of, sort of like short, sort of like short films, short, short sort of. Uh, they were short films. They were all short films. I, I think they may even have all been under 10 minutes. I, I don't want to be quoted on that, but I think that's, that's close to the truth. If not the truth. And then and, and there's the Bone Collector, um, and there's uh, that's a Washington and Jimmy Jones, mm -hmm. uh, and Neil. Um, so you get you start moving to all these these, these larger projects. Uh, but then in addition, now you have a whole other side of things happening as well. So you're you're involved in, in music and stand up comedy as well. Is that is that correct? The stand up comedy came later. At the time that you're talking about, the music was very much alive. I had been writing songs from the time that I was a teenager, mm. though I 
pursued it, started to pursue it professionally in my 20s. And I made my first record in between, I believe, She's the One and Brothers McMullen. And that's a pretty wide swath. Right before I made Bone Collector, I believe, I had completed my first album, which is entitled Hero. And, or relatively, relatively soon to, to the making of Bone Collector, Hero had been finalized. And that, so my life was very involved with music simultaneous to film. And I had also been writing books at that time. I had not been published at that time. And it was still in, in an emerging state for me in other ways, though all of these things were, were happening in uh, simultaneity in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And do you, now the stand-up stand comedy as well, is this a, was this something, fairly, is this something fairly new or was this something from a while back as well? Well, stand-up comedy was something that I didn't ever pursue with any type of intentionality. I was invited to take part in a stand-up comedy event called Comedy Covers by my dear friend Pete Corielli. When Jim Brewer had his show on Sirius XM called Brewer Unleashed, he had this, sh this show within a show called Comedy Covers where he would host an event where comedians would come and perform the work of other comedians either as themselves or in an alter ego. Mm -hmm. And Pete Corielli honored me by inviting me to be the first non-comedian to take part in one of these events. Mm -hmm. And because he did that, now people actually consider me a stand-up comedian because from there forward, I've done other engagements. And Kenny the Gun on the Kenny the Gun channel operates in a very kind of stand-up comedic way, etc. Though stand-up comedy is not a, a, a career that I have pursued. And I even hesitate at times to accept the moniker of stand-up comedian. I'm extremely honored by it. Mm -hmm. So because I don't actively pursue it and I'm not on that beat like a lot of other guys are, and it's, it is a beat, man. It's a significant investment of time and energy, and it takes a lot to get up on that stage again and again and again. And that's, I'm not in that world with it. Mm -hmm. So when people consider me a stand-up comedian, I'm highly honored though I, I'm, I'm very careful to say that this is not something that I, I, I consider as uh, entirely accurate in terms of, of what I'm doing. Though at the same time, I, I, I'm extremely honored by the title. And, and are you still, um, are, you, are you releasing any new, new albums? Uh, are, you, are you working on the music side of things at the moment? As yes, well? the music is always with me and there are actually three full records lined up, even an EP in addition to that, that I am holding off on releasing until we get Kenny the Gun situated, sold, and on the air, which I promise you we are going to do. We are still in the process of, of finding Kenny the Gun a home. And for those of you who aren't aware, Kenny the Gun is the television series that I created that features me as a New York City police detective, which Jonathan is very aware of. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and, and we're gonna, and, and just a moment, we're going to get into the, the take any gun. I just want to say one other thing. Um, so then uh, some years later, then you reunite back again with Ed Burns. You do Fitzgerald Family Christmas. Yes. Um, and was that sort of a nostalgic feeling, sort of being back together again, doing that sort of local Long Island suburban type of indie film? It was wonderful. I, I will say that it was similar to the experience of, of She's the One with some Brothers McMullen added in mm. because we had other people with names on the sets. Though it was financed in a similar way to Brothers McMullen, 
meaning there wasn't studio involvement. And it felt like both of those experiences in one. Because we were at some of Eddie's family homes for that one too, at least one, his sister's house. And then a friend loaned a house, I think we were in, maybe been a family member too. I think it was a friend though. And so there were these favors like Brothers McMullen and it was on a, a lesser budget, though it had this other feeling of it where there were people that you would recognize in the movie, uh, two of which we were. So it had that feeling to it as well. It was very special. And at one point we were shooting a scene and Eddie's crouched down, I think for camera or lighting reasons, he's not in the scene. And I am next to him. I, maybe I'm gonna enter the scene or I'm just watching the scene. I can't remember what my involvement was, but I'm relatively certain Eddie was not actually in the scene, but we were close to each other and he was crouched down and I was either bent over or standing up and he looked up at me and he, he had this look of pleasure and happiness on his face and he smiled and I believe it was a thumbs up. And it was this unspoken moment of brothers, she's the one, yeah, that we're doing it again, this feels great. And again, no words, but I, I feel I ultimately understood what that was and I felt the same way. It was really beautiful and wonderful. Very cool. Um, so now you're working on your first projects, Can You Not? Now, I'm just, well, I just want to start with sort of how this whole concept came to you. Where did this all come from? <laughs> some of the films here we've been talking about. Kenny the Gun was first a character born on the set of The Bone Collector on the soundstage in Montreal where we shot most of that film. I was wearing a gun, I believe for the first time, playing a detective also named Kenny, though he wasn't Irish, his name was Kenny Solomon. And on the set, I spontaneously came up with this alter ego that I was calling Kenny the gun. I have always been someone, for, well, from a very early age, I, I believe it actually always is, is still accurate, always been someone who wanted to be at the center of attention, wanted to perform, wanted to enjoy showmanship and performance. And that part of me was extremely alive with my co-stars on Bone Collector. So Eddie O'Neill, Angelina Jolie, Queen Latifah, Denzel had responsibilities to his character that required a concentration that kept him away from us in a certain respect. At least that, that, that seemed to be a, a predominant reason for it. He was playing a, a quadriplegic. And so our interactions on the set weren't always as directly with him as with each other. So, I would walk up to Angelina Jolie and I would say, oh, my friend, I think you've forgotten with whom you deal, Kenny. And then I throw the jacket back, tap my gun and say, the gun. And just like you're doing now, she would smile. I would do it with Eddie. He would smile. I do these routines. You know, he's a very New York guy and he talks like this and he's very bravura-esque and noticeable and fun and funny. And Queen Latifah on the set, at one point when I did this, she looked at me and she said, you got to do something with that. And that resonated with me. And I thought, yes, that's accurate. And I didn't know what I would do with it. I didn't know what to do with it, etc. But I remember those words remaining with me. And then years later, I realized I can create a show around this character that I know brings people happiness and people gravitate to. And so I did, I created a television series around this guy who was born out of my desire to perform for my friends on the set of The Bone Collector. And now it's a, it's a dramedy that centers around a Queens, New York cop who finds himself in the tricky position of being on the precipice of being ejected from the police force for questionable conduct. 
He's compelled to psychiatric evaluation in the course of which you find out what led to his uh, essential uh, blow up. Is this the first time that you yourself created uh, a project full on, like a character that you created and you put together and you wrote and developed? Is this the first time where you've done something similar before? Yes, Kenny the Gun was the first project that centered around a character that I had created and also was being financed by me, produced by me, directed by me, and had been written by me. All, all of the responsibilities of Kenny the Gun in the, in the most producerial sense and the literary sense and the performance sense belong to me. And that's been very special. I enjoyed the greater responsibility of that. And I also enjoyed the, the freedom of doing it on my own because it was, again, so independent that there was no one else involved. I mean, I would listen to my producing partner's ideas and, and, and anyone's ideas who I thought was, was qualified and, and could help the piece, though it was my project and it, no decision was going to be made finally without me. Going forward, that may change when we have more deep conversations about the sale of the show and when we do sell the show, uh, when we do sell the show, rather, as I say, uh, which I promise you we will do. And I'm open to those conversations. People want to talk about the destiny of Kenny, what, what Kenny will do, what he's doing now, how that could be differently shaped. I do have a very strong idea and a, a first season already written. So if they want to pick it up and they want to shoot 11 episodes of this guy, it's ready to be done. If they want to tweak it, they want to talk more about it, I'm open to that too when we have those conversations. And if, if, if additional episodes are produced, would you again be directing? I know you've written. I, if, if I'm offered the responsibility of directing, I'd take it. I don't know if the, if, if the group that we're finally going to be working with on this is not going to want someone else to direct it. And if they do, I'm on board. I, I, I'm open to that. The uh, Kenny is a character that I was born to play and I was destined to bring to the world. I know that. I don't say that with any arrogance. I say that with an awareness of uh, the spirituality of this project and how it belongs to me. So as far as directing it, I, I don't have a vested interest in that necessarily being my role. I know that I could do it. So if they want me to do it, I'll do it. Though if they don't want me to do it, I'm, I'm fine to, to collaborate with someone else on it. From your early days as an actor, did you know that you eventually wanted to write, direct, create a character for yourself or is this an unexpected thing that just happened on the set of the bone collector that you never had thought of before well actually that awareness didn't even happen on the bone collector as i said when queen latifah said you got to do something with that i didn't readily have an idea of what that would be right. i i i only knew that i had this character who made people laugh mm -hmm. and I, I won't say that it was that anything is totally unexpected in my creative life because I think I was born to do all the things that I'm doing. It was just a matter of my awareness in my life catching up to my destiny. So there were things that when I was born, I didn't know consciously, but that when they were revealed to me, there wasn't any surprise. So when I, when I was a kid who needed an inordinate amount of attention, I wasn't surprised by that. All kids need a lot of attention. I needed an excessive amount, Jonathan, and that's an actor's truth. I loved to perform. I loved to get up on stage. Naturally, this was, I didn't, I didn't have to be forced. This was naturally what I wanted to do. I naturally wanted to write poems. I naturally wanted to write 
books and stories. And then finally, for the screen, I was in a, a situation recurringly where my destiny was being revealed to me. And I was being shown that you have gifts to do all these things and you have happiness doing all these things. So go and do these things. And it's been a blessing. And of course there have been income fluctuations and that is accepted. It's a part of uh, anyone's life to, to some extent. And uh, in a creative life, it can be a very excessive part of your life that there's feast and famine. Uh, I, I exaggerate, of course, it was never fully famine, but it was uh, times where there was great stress about money and you have to be ready for that too. That has to be a part of your nature too. You have to accept that as a reality, fundamentally, and move through it with an attitude that is unswervingly confident. You don't know where the money's gonna come from, but you know you're not gonna give up and it's gonna come. If that is not your attitude, you should think about being in a career that demands that much confidence from you because things are going to change. It's a, it, there, things are in flux on a regular basis for a lot of different actors at diff on different strata. And you have to fundamentally believe that you're always going to move through to the place of abundance, no matter what your circumstances are in the moment. Kenny the gun is a great example of that in my life because there have been fears that have beset me. There have been other shadows that have beset me about making things happen and, and, and creating uh, success or collaborating with the success that you were destined to be. So self-doubt doesn't help and you have to acknowledge that if it comes up, acknowledge it, let it happen, though don't give into it. Let it just be a part of how you're going to understand humanity on a higher level and don't let it be a vital part of your psychological makeup because outside of it being what can help you as an artist to understand your own fragility and your own vulnerability to such things, it's not going to help you. What you have to have is an awareness that you've been given gifts and you've been given the power to realize them in the world. And your responsibility is to realize that power. And I live in the humility of the receipt of these gifts. And I live in the pride of knowing that I can bring them to the fore. And that's what I'm going to do with Kenny the Gun. Oh, that's great. Um, I think one of the things I always like to ask you know, writers and filmmakers and artists, why would you say, what would you say is the most important reason why people should see Kenny the Gun? What can they learn from it? What will they walk away with? How will their lives be enhanced after having seen Kenny the Gun? That's a wonderful question, and I thank you for that question, Jonathan. Extremely intelligent and insightful. I'm not surprised, knowing you, that that's the case. Though I wanted to express my particular appreciation for that very uh, wonderful question. What people can take from Kenny the Gun is an awareness of our communal vulnerability in a beautiful sense and our communal strength. Kenny is a character who has a lot of masculine energy. As I said before, a lot of bravado. He has a lot of capacity to make people believe he can get in any situation and be confident and achieve success in certain situations that a lot of people would find challenging. And I think a lot of uh, people in law enforcement and military have that type of nature where they can come into challenging circumstances and feel commanding and also have a certain degree of success in those circumstances. What you'll see in Kenny too, is that there's something that goes on for him psychologically that he doesn't want to face. That's extremely fragile and does doubt himself very much. This is a good example of how self-doubt is a currency that artists can use. I've had to look at my own, at times, hesitance to look at 
my fragility and my vulnerability because I always want to present in a powerful way, in a strong way. And I don't want people to see the vulnerability and the person who's afraid to cry in front of somebody or the person who doesn't want to cry because they think it's weak, et cetera. And I had to look at that for Kenny because Kenny was this guy whose resistance of all his vulnerability came to such a level that it had to express itself in some way. And it expressed itself in a lot of chaotic ways in his professional life and his personal life. There were things that were brought into question about his conduct on the job where they say, this is unacceptable. And what you're doing is unacceptable. And he doesn't know why. When you first meet him, he doesn't know why he's conducting himself in a way that is so crazy. He's so in his own resistance to what's going on with him that he doesn't even necessarily see it as crazy. That's how crazy it got. And when you look at this guy, if you look at what he's doing and you think, how do you not see that's crazy? You know, it's, that's crazy. <laughs> then he gets into therapy. He's an Irish Catholic guy. He's in therapy. And the only way that he can save his job is to get a good grade from this guy who he doesn't want to talk to, but he has to talk to in order to get a good grade. So there's this tension about what's he going to talk about? Are you really going to look at what's going on with you? and how you are vulnerable and how you are in need of psychiatric attention and all of that. So people can, can take from Kenny that everyone has the strength and everyone has the vulnerability and we have to share both with each other. And, and would, you, would you consider Kenny um, ultimately a hero? Is he a heroic character? He wouldn't consider himself a, a hero. He's actually very clear on that in the course of his therapy. He, in, in the course of the, of the show, you learn that at one point, he raced into a burning building to save two small children and their pregnant mother. He made the cover of the paper, the, the Daily News, as it's made clear in the show, and he's a celebrated hero. Mm -hmm. he, doesn't, he doesn't welcome that title. His view of that is, I did what anyone who had the capacity to do that would do in good conscience. And I don't think that we should be considering that heroic. I think we should be considering that what we consider normal conduct. You see people in stress, you can help them, you should help them. Don't consider me a hero. I don't want to be considered a hero, period, that's it. What interiorly with that is dealt with with Kenny is however, he doesn't want to acknowledge on some level when he resists that so hard, and he does resist it, he resists it real hard. What you have to look at is the fact that he doesn't want to give himself a compliment. He doesn't want to accept that there are these things that are really shiningly brave and beautiful about him as well. And that he can say that that's true and not be an arrogant fool. But he's so resistant to any idea that anything like that is out of the norm that he can, he can very convincingly make the argument that, no, it doesn't have to do with me not feeling good about myself. It's only about me being right in my thinking. But on, on a very, on a very, intimate level, Kenny's resistance to consider himself heroic is tied up with his inability to receive a compliment on some level. Right. And Kenny's character is like very New York. Um, oh, yeah. did, you, did you know early on that you wanted the character to be a New York character? New oh, York he, was, he was born a New York character. When I was on the set of, of Bone Collector, I was playing a New York detective that wasn't like Kenny the Gun, but he was a New York detective. And I, I just created a character that was very noticeably New York. With the accent, the movements, etc. And Kenny's also a boxer. The character I play on Bone Collector, you know, none of this was was salient in his nature whereas kenny is he's you you can't deny that he's new york someone would see him and within the first 30 seconds of him speaking and for the first five seconds you'd see this is a new york guy this is a new york detective 
Have you always been um, interested in sort of like uh, New York sort of cop stories? Have you watched like uh, been into shows like that or films like that? Um, that, that things that may have helped inspire you know, your interest? I, I love so many different characters, Jonathan. So I won't say that it's, it's particularly a, a, a genre based attraction. It's a, it's a character based attraction. The, the cops who have been on TV are characters because cops are characters. And I love that aspect of it. Not all cops though are characters, but there's something about a New York cop. There's something about a cop that has a, an inbred personality, not with all of them, but with, with certain of them. And Kojak mm -hmm. and Columbo, Kenny the Gun. And I, I, I don't in any way put Kenny the Gun at, at, at that level of accomplishment presently. I put him in, in, the, in that area because he's that level of character. Of course, you know, Kenny has not enjoyed the multi-seasons that those characters have. So I didn't express any arrogance in putting him with there. But I, putting him there, I wanted to make it clear that it's, he's, a, he's a New York guy and he's a cop. And there's something about uh, a cop's personality sometimes that's very animated. That's why some of them, when they retire from the force, become very successful actors. That's a fact. Sure. So, so not all of them do, but there are certain guys who have a very theatrical bent to them. And I think that's why you see so many cops in relief in shows and created and put in shows and why people go back to cops again and again, like gangsters. It's similar. That's a similar attraction. You know, not all gangsters were like Tommy DeVito and Goodfellas, right. but you you're gravitating to the gangster because there are so many different theatrical personalities. They're noticeable. A lot of those guys are very noticeable personalities. So, I've always been someone who gravitates to theatrical things and cops can be very theatrical and so can gangsters and a lot of different people can be very theatrical. And so that's more what it's about. But then playing a cop too I, is just a ball, you know, like playing a gangster. There's something about that world that's extremely appealing to me. It's very interesting. And I, I also understand being an Irish American myself, and someone who understands a, a blue collar experience just in my blood, I also feel that there's an affinity I have for my brethren. I, Cause that's how I consider them. When I see them, I, I don't see foreign people. I see people who I immediately recognize. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you continue on and do a whole, let's say 11 episode, uh, season how would you like to see kenny's character sort of change and evolve as the season goes on well the season is written so i i i already know how he's going to evolve once we get him situated and again we are going to get him situated and you're going to be able to see jonathan an answer to your question in that when we have it on the air cool cool and just to go back uh, you know, I, I, was, I was talking about distribution earlier on when you first started it out in the 90s and McMullen and all that. Now, of course, self-distribution is a very viable option. There's so many opportunities now. Mm -hmm. you know, whatever it might be, Amazon or Vimeo or, you know, uh, you know there's, there's, um, there's aggregators and iTunes and all sorts of things. Would you consider uh, releasing it yourself or is your goal ultimately to pick, sell it to a network? I, my focus now is selling it to a streaming service network and having the support of all that. And the show warrants that. The show is on a level that I know will attract the audience that it deserves. Again, none of that is expressed with arrogance. I know that Kenny is a a character who people gravitate to. I've, I've done a one-man show 
with him. I've screened him. As you know, the Big Apple Film Festival hosted a, a screening of on-screen footage of Kenny the Gun. And like where he comes from on the set of The Bone Collector, this is a character who people want to watch and people enjoy and people smile about and think about. And so that's why my focus currently is predominantly on uh, having a contract with a streaming service because that's the support that I know it's, it, it warrants. Right, right, right. If, if something did present itself that was viable to get Kenny the proper audience in another way, I'm open to that too, though. That is not something, however, that is in the, in the forefront of consideration. Though, you know, private financing is also something that I have considered with Kenny the Gun too, which is, I think, another way of uh, doing what you're talking about. So I'm open to, to numerous different possibilities. Predominantly right now, our pursuit is to be in touch with producers who are going to get us in conversation with the networks and then get us our contract and get us shooting and on the air. Nice. And, and I know maybe jumping ahead, but I know you have 11 episodes. Would you even move on to a second season or is this more of a one season kind of? I, for my own reasons of psychic apprehension and to keep things very insulated creatively for me in a very uh, positively protective way, I don't, I only have very kind of nascent images of anything beyond the first season. And that's out of humility. You know, getting getting a show sold is a, an accomplishment enough. Getting to the top of that hill is what I'm focused on right now. So putting the that would be to some extent putting the cart before the horse for me in a way that does not feel as humble as I should be. So that's one of the reasons I only have nascent images of it. I do have images of it, and if a streaming network and a and 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 or a uh, another network would want to talk about the future of Kenny, I'm ready to talk about it. Upon their invitation though, not before. If they want to talk about it, I'm going to let them know I'm ready to have that conversation. Though I'm not putting the cart before the horse in, 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 in ways that I feel are going to imperil my humility with getting the first season done. And ju just some advice, we, you know, most of the uh, you know, individuals that are involved at our film festival are emerging filmmakers, people who are sort of just starting out. Uh, what strategies have you uh, utilized to try to get Kenny the Gun out there? Um, how have you gone about pitching it? Uh, you know, because we have so many filmmakers that are trying to, to do, you know, si you know, similar kind of thing. They're trying to sell a series, they're trying to sell a film, they're trying to get it out there. What are, what are some strategies that you've employed? The, the fundamental strategy always is do your absolute best. Do not look at something and say it's good enough because good enough is not good enough. I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. I mean, good enough is not good enough. Great is what you're after and you can do it. You can make it great. Make it the best you can make it. That's how you're gonna get the attention that you deserve. So pay attention to all the details. Know that the work is challenging. It's joyous. There are going to be pitfalls. There are going to be highs. There are going to be lows. It's all beautiful. It's all in the context of beauty and creativity and wonder and strength. And move through it with grace. Move through it with ultimate confidence. And when you have something that you feel is at the highest level that you feel you can achieve, then start strategizing with however your equipment dictates. If you don't know producers, find a way to get to know producers, and then you can introduce your project to them. So there are so many different ways to the mountaintop, and not a lot of people have contacts, or some people don't have contacts when they start out. That's true of almost everybody. Some people are born into contacts, they have a parent, they have, you know, that's, that happens. Though most situations, people don't have contacts. They have a desire to have a career and they won't go after it. That's what happens. And 
So just know that you're in very good company having no contacts. A lot of people had no contacts. What they did have was a gift, a talent. And then they had work to show for it and work to show for it and work to show for it. So that's fundamentally what you need. The other is going to come with your work ethic because what comes with the great gift also with a lot of these people is the desire to show the gift to the world. That's what the artist wants to do. You know, the, the, the artists who talk about, you know, I make this for myself, I don't feel necessarily convinced by. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I haven't really met an artist who didn't want their creation to be acknowledged in some way. And I am all, always aware that the people who I'm seeing talk about, I didn't do this to get attention, are in an interview where they're getting attention. So I'm wondering, ah, well, how do you see it happen then? I mean, I, and again, I don't mean this disrespectfully. I mean it objectively that I don't see that in alignment with your truth somehow. I, I think that they, they're, they're, they're potentially not seeing that elementally an artist is calling for attention to what they create. It's a part of the magic of being an artist. You create something and you wonder at it and you want other people to see it because it's an expression of beauty and love and you and them and it's gorgeous and it's wonderful and you should want people to see it because it's, it's a large part of how we connect. So that's what I would recommend. Do great work. Don't stop at what you consider to be good enough keep going, make it great, and or what you consider great, and then keep going, keep going, keep going. If your desire is strong enough to achieve, you will achieve, period. Doesn't matter what I say about do this, do that, get on that phone call, do this, do that. You'll figure those things out because you will demand that you figure those things out. That's what's going on with me, with Kenny the Gun, right now. When I don't have a contact, when I don't have a connection, it's, well, get back to work and find your way to that result. And you will stay committed to it. So please know that when I'm giving this answer to them, I'm living the answer with Kenny the Gun right now. And I'm with everyone on that front. And I wish them the greatest success. Awesome. Wow. Thank you very much. And You're welcome. In conclusion, There, if, if anyone searches Kenny the Gun, the first two links that come up in my experience are for the YouTube channel, which is the broad comedy delivery of the character, and then there is the trailer for the scripted series. The YouTube channel is broad comedy delivery, and the trailer is the scripted series content. So if they want to see the trailer, they'll click on that link. And if they want to see the YouTube comedy, they click on that link. And I would welcome everyone to do both. And please connect on Facebook if you wish. Reach out to me personally if you wish. And if there are people that you feel are right to consider Kenny as a show, I'm open to any number of communications about all of that. And I'm looking for all kinds of audience expansion. So I welcome them to go to the YouTube channel, search for the trailer, connect with me on Facebook, and also like the pages if you're moved to do so, and communicate with me as you wish. Cool. So you go to YouTube, type in Kenny the Gun, or Google, type in Kenny the Gun. You Google Kenny the Gun, will get you YouTube and the trailer. If you go to if you go to YouTube Kenny the Gun, you'll go right to the channel. If you do the Google, if you do the Google search, though, you're going to get the trailer and the channel. So that's what I would recommend. Gotcha. And Facebook is a Kenny the Gun as well. I'm sorry. Uh, Facebook is a Kenny the Gun. Go Facebook. Yes. At, at Kenny the Gun will take you right to the page. And also, when you publicize our interview, Jonathan, at Kenny the Gun is the tag that if you'll tag him. In it, I would prefer. Definitely. Will do. Thank you. Uh, personal website as well? 
Yeah, there's also Aquafulmaglone, which is the that's a that's the professional page for me. And there's at Kenny the Gun, and then there's Michael McGlone. There's the personal page as well. Okay, and your website is michaelmcglone.com. Michaelmcglone.com. Yes. Perfect. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for uh, speaking with me today. I'm sure our audience will really, really love it, and uh, wish you much luck and success with Kenny the Gun. I'm looking forward to seeing the whole series. And, thank uh, you, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Michael McGlone. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, and I thank you also. Thank you. All right. Bye bye now. Bye-bye.